So welcome, bienvenidos to today's workshop on using community indicators for planning and public policy, a practice session with DataShare. I'm Nicole Lezen. I'm one of the local consultants, along with Nicole Young, who facilitates a countywide initiative called the Collective of Results and Evidence-Based, or CORE, Investments, which is a collective impact approach to achieving equitable health and well-being for all people across the lifespan in Santa Cruz County. And we're co-facilitating today's workshop with Eva Holt from DataShare. And we'll, we're also joined by Jennifer Martin, who's the Santa Cruz County Women's Commission co-chair. She'll be talking about how the commission has used data share indicators to understand women's equity in our county and how this understanding can influence local public policy. And as you can hear, today's session is held in English with Spanish interpretation. Gisela Carrasco is providing consecutive interpretation right now, and she'll also translate any written comments or questions you may have. And soon we'll switch to simultaneous interpretation, which is provided by Stella Lauerman. Go ahead and turn it over to Nicole Young, who's gonna provide a, a quick overview of core investments before we get into more details of today's session. Thanks, Nicole. So again, CORE stands for the Collective of Results and Evidence-Based Investments, and it's both a funding model and a broader movement to achieve equitable health and well-being in Santa Cruz County using a results-based collective impact approach that's responsive to community needs. And you'll see that on the next slide here that CORE has evolved over many years now uh, based on input and insights that we've gathered from a variety of partners from local government, philanthropy, nonprofits, and different community groups. And so this iterative collaborative process has led to things like the core mission and vision statement that we're showing on the side where equity is really front and center of everything. And when we say equitable health and well being, we mean that all people across the lifespan will have equitable opportunities to experience these eight interdependent core conditions for health and well-being, and that people's opportunities and their life outcomes aren't predictable for better or for worse by things like race, ethnicity, income level, gender identity, sexual orientation, or any other ways that we often think about our social and cultural identities. Uh, and we put equity at the center as a constant reminder that in order to achieve that equity in health and well-being, we often have to look at everything in terms of our programs, our practices, our policies, to examine how they might be um, either helping and contributing to equity or might actually be part of the barriers and the contributors to those persistent gaps and inequities that we see show up in data and uh, in people's stories. So when we think of both CORE as a funding model and a movement, it's really about how do we uh, really articulate and work towards a common set of goals? How do we use data, data and community level indicators to help us uh, understand how close or far we are to those community level goals? So that's a very much a theme in today's workshop. And so today's workshop and other events like CORE Coffee Chats and other trainings that we offer are done through what we call the Core Institute for Innovation and Impact. So think of the Core Institute as the learning arm of core investments. Um, and you'll um, hear a lot more coming up soon about some of the specific training and technical assistance that we'll be offering to support people as they are preparing their applications for the next core funding process. So keep an eye and an ear out for all of those coming up. But for now, I'd like to go ahead and um, turn it over to Eva, who's going to tell us a little bit more about what we're covering today. Hi, Nicole. Thank you. Hi, my name is Eva Holt, and I'm a social impact consultant based here in Santa Cruz County, um, and I'm the project coordinator for DataShare. So for those who are less familiar with the DataShare platform, it is an interactive platform with over 400 indicators from local, state, and national sources. We aim to have the updated version of all data and reports with our most current information being shared uh, at no cost to the public. And DataShare is constantly changing with new indicators being added. 
Um, this is the platform that is the central hub of information that helps create alignment by allowing everyone to measure outcomes with the same metrics and indicators. And um, one of the aspects of this platform is that we are able to integrate data sets such as the safety net clinic utilization data that has been previously unavailable to the public. We know that students, researchers, advocacy groups, program evaluators, grant writers, and fundraisers use our platform. So I'm happy to be here today. Thanks, Eva. Just wanted to go over some of our goals for today's session. We, um, we're going to review some of the key steps and tips in program planning that we've gone over before, but just to tie those to some of the content today. Um, and as always, focusing on equity. And specifically, we want to explore the use of community indicators like the ones that are in the core investments framework and on data share for program planning and public policy. And one of the ways that we're going to try to illustrate that is by highlighting the way these indicators have been used for um, some some data spotlights from the Women's Commission. So that's where we'll, where Eva will interview uh, Jennifer. And just to get a sense of where everybody is today, we wanted to do a quick poll with some, um, some questions about your reactions to the words uh, program planning and public policy. Do they make you want to do a happy dance? Do you feel a mix of excitement and apprehension? Do you fall immediately into a deep trance or do you just want to run from the room? And wherever you are on this spectrum, and maybe it varies day to day or topic to topic, mm. we're happy to entertain that. So let us know. Okay, see some results coming in. We've got at least one happy dancer. Mm. We've got a lot of mix. And that happy dancer is balanced by a deep trance person and a run from the room person. Nicole, I'll go ahead and end the poll so that we can share the results and see them right. on screen. And uh, that's my loud dog trying to respond to the poll as well. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Having a mix of, of technical and canine issues today. All righty. Well, thanks for the honest responses. Um, please wait for your trance or running from the room for another hour or so. And we'll try and our best to keep you awake. So just to review some key steps in program planning that may be very familiar to many of you. Um, first, we, we just wanted to define um, a program as a set of activities that are linked together, uh, supported by some resources, internal or external, and designed to achieve some specific outcomes for individuals, for groups, for neighborhoods and communities. And program planning is just the way that we describe how you design and intend to achieve these outcomes. So which activities supported by which combination of resources to reach which specific outcomes and for whom. And so that's a formulation many of you mentioned being here for grant writing um, and proposal uh, purposes. So that's really the way that, that uh, we think about defining a program, especially to explain it to others, to funders, um, partners, et cetera. And some key steps in program planning are to, of course, identify the main issue that you're trying to address. So sometimes it's a subset of other things that you're working on, um, and other times it's, it's broader. But just making some effort to put some fences or parameters around the issue that you're addressing. For and with whom, and exactly how you are trying to, uh, to address the issue. So we just uh, also want to highlight some resources that can help um, 
we're going to be doing some more detailed training on logic models and theories of change. And you've probably heard us tout them before, but we find them really helpful for answering these kinds of questions and for addressing the assumptions behind your, your program and your planning, which um, are not always shared. Sometimes it seems really self-evident what you're doing and why, and other times um, doing, doing something like this can be really helpful. Um, I think Stella is going to uh, put a resource in the chat that I'll, I'm going to stop my screen share of the slides for just a moment and, and share one of several resources. So if you want to follow along on DataShare, so I'm hoping you can see this. On DataShare, under the Local Progress page, that's where you can get to the core results menu, which is the, the information that Nicole Young just reviewed. Um, within that, is this core continuum of results and evidence, which is in English and Spanish. And this is a, a way to think about your program in terms of the evidence that's already behind it or that you may be helping to develop. So it might be an emerging program that has not been evaluated yet or something that's a good idea with some informal evaluation to it or something that has started to be formally evaluated. All of which I just wanna emphasize are all valid um, for, for any program because they, um, they move through this sequence in general. And so you, you just might be at a different point than, a di than another program and knowing where you are is really helpful for um, trying to describe your program to to funders and to draw support, but also to design some evaluation questions about it, which we'll talk about in just a moment. So this is just one of many resources that are available on DataShare. Let me return to my slides now. And today we did want to talk about not just a, a program, but a specific type of, of effort with um, an emphasis on public policy. And so I'm going to turn it over to Eva to go over that with us. Thanks, Nicole. Um, yeah, so we'll just start um, with a, a brief review of kind of what public policy is. So this is the decisions that are made by government bodies to address social issues and promote public well-being. And this can include laws, regulations, and programs. Um, the aim of public policy is to promote public well-being. And unlike a private or even a nonprofit program, a key tenant of good public policy is that it is shaped by public input, values, and priorities. And it can be national, regional, or local. There's some key steps and um, uh, for creating public policy, and they typically follow a series um, that's listed here. Um, the specific details may vary depending on the level of government and complexity of the issue. So with agenda setting, this is where a problem or an issue comes to the attention of policymakers and the public. This can include media coverage, public protests, or research um, that uh, have played a role in putting this issue on the agenda. And agenda setting is framed and greatly influenced by informed advocacy. So this is a space in which advocates have policy ideas and lead the building of this public pressure and political will. Um, this can include steps like power mapping and program evaluations, as well as community assessments. And then there's policy formation. This is once an issue has um, been put onto the agenda, policymakers begin to develop potential solutions. So this can include further research, public hearings, consultation with experts and stakeholders. And as a reminder, it is not just policymakers who write policy. A lot of modeling off of other communities, lobby groups, um, uh, also write policies and advocates tend to do a lot of a lot of the drafting for bills um, for policymakers. Um, and 
Uh, then there's policy adoption. So this is when policymakers can debate and vote on proposed solutions. Um, and this can happen at the legislative level, so laws, or through executive actions through regulations. Um, I'll just flag here that organizational policies can also change culture and promote public well-being, such as equitable hiring policies or employee policies for health and safety that go beyond the health and safety regulations in place currently. And this is a kind of modeling that can influence what is possible. Um, so this is kind of the way in which organizations can lead the formation of new rules of engagement. Then there's the implementation phase where policy is adopted and gets put into action. This involves allocating resources, hiring staff, developing procedures for carrying out the policy followed by evaluation um, to assess the effectiveness of the policy. Has it achieved the intended goals? Are there any unintended consequences? Um, and this information is used to refine or even repeal a policy in the future. And interim outcomes can include the changing of public opinion or educating the media, et cetera. And these steps are identifiable progress. Um, and to note that sometimes termination is a key step in public policy. So um, if policies are found to be ineffective or outdated, um, they may be terminated or replaced. And I think one of the key things um, that we always refer to is how are policies centering equity and um, is the policy paying attention to not just what are we measuring, but how um, and who decides what the policy is and what the measurement is and how that's interpreted, as well as who is most benefiting from pol the policy and who may be the most harmed from the policy. Thanks, Eva. So now we want to turn to some of the community indicators that can be relevant for both formulating policies and assessing how well they are or are not working. And so on DataShare, um, we have community indicators that help to um, determine whether or not you're having the impact that you are hoping to achieve through these activities. And they can tell part of the story about whether well-being is um, being bolstered or hindered by different kinds of policies and programs. Um, we really want to emphasize that it can seem really overwhelming to think about um, community indicators and your contributions to them or influence on them. It's really important to remember that at the, the community indicator level or these, this broad impact level, you're not trying to achieve that by yourself. So your organization um, might be one of many trying to um, achieve a certain community-wide result that's reflected in these indicators. So um, if, you, if you look at these and start feeling like there's no way that we could impact that alone, that's right. Um, it's generally something that coalesces a lot of different organizations and efforts to try to achieve some broader impact. And the, the core results menu on DataShare is a great place to start looking at some of these in different categories and to try to see where your efforts might match up with some of these community indicators. Um, they're also a great way to think about um, the equity lens for progress and impact. So is that the progress that you're hoping to achieve distributed equitably across groups and communities and places? Are there differences by age or race or ethnicity or zip code? And DataShare is um, increasingly able to offer us those types of insights by disaggregating data with those kinds of dimensions. But today we're gonna to talk about a specific example of, a com of community indicators and how they've been used. And that is the data spotlight that is um, put together by the, the Women's Commission, the Countywide Women's Commission to track women's well-being. So let me switch to sharing that site, that page on DataShare, and you'll see a link in the chat as well.
And this is the page that you're going to hear more about in just a moment. And the way to get to this or any other data spotlight is from the data spotlight tab. And you can see a number of other topics here that may be of, of particular interest to people on the call. But this one is the women's well being one. And you can see that it has a demographic overview and some other um, links that you can follow and some ways to use this map. So let me stop there for a moment and first of all, see if there are any questions on anything we've covered so far at this point. Feel free to raise your hand or jump in or raise something in the chat and, and we'll have some uh, time for questions a little later as well. But just wanted to pause since we have a little time. Cheryl, go ahead. Yeah, so sorry, I have to be off camera, but Nicole, okay. just a quick question. I also jumped over to the Santa Cruz website for the community indicators and underneath it, it says it is currently being developed and will be presented fall 2024. Do you know a little bit more about that that you could speak to? I'm not sure which site you're referring to, Cheryl. Is that the county's? It's the county site, yeah. Yeah, I I don't know. Um, That's okay. No, it's okay. I'm thinking it will. I just I I I'm just interested because I know it's going to be really important to future funding uh, priorities for the county, and mm -hmm. um and it's helpful when we are assessing the right things. <laughs> so I was just looking looking for any insight you might have to that. Yeah, so I don't know the schedule, but I do know that there is um, a lot of intention to align with what you're seeing on DataShare and with the okay, perfect. framework. Yeah. Okay, perfect. Right. Thank you. It might be a subset or um, some other sources, but but I I would be optimistic that it aligns well with what we're looking at here. It, that's that's uh, that's perfect. That's exactly what we need to know. Thank you so much, Nicole. You're welcome. Thanks for the question. Any other questions? Okay, let's see. I will stop my screen share and turn it over to Eva and Jennifer, who are going to have a conversation about the development of this data spotlight. And so just um, feel free to click on the link if you want to look at it yourself, but I'll stop my screen share so we can at least see right. each other. Thank you, Nicole. Over to you. Thank you. Um, so we have with us today, Jennifer Martin. She is the chair of the Santa Cruz County Women's Commission. And professionally, Ms. Martin has been an attorney, an attorney focused on cybersecurity for the last 25 years. Initially joining the US Department of Justice's newly created computer crime section in the late 1990s. Since then, she has worked on the legal policy and technical aspects of cybersecurity from various capacities in both the public and private sectors. In addition to her law degree, she has a BS and an MS in mathematics. And we're so happy to have you here. Jennifer, thanks for joining us. Thank you for inviting me. This is, uh, this is a great collaboration uh, between organizations because I think we're all focused on kind of the same goals. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. So um, I was hoping we could just start um, with you telling us a, briefly about your role with the Women's Commission and its intersection with data. Sure. Um, so I was appointed, um, I joined the commission, which is an appointed body by the Board of Supervisors, which is an elected body for each of the five districts in Santa Cruz County. Um, I was appointed to the Women's Commission probably two years ago. Um, became co-chair last year and recently learned that my co-chair um, has left, so I'm now chair. Um, and the uh, the purpose of the Women's Commission and really all of the commissions are their unelected uh, uh, bodies that are tasked with making recommendations to the board, um, in, in our case, to remedy uh, gender-based inequities. So our job is to... <clears throat> Uh, first of all, figure out what our goals are, and then to figure out where those 
uh, where those gaps are and what our priorities are going to be, and then make recommendations to uh, the board. We don't necessarily implement those rec recommendations, but we'll 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 work with other policymaking bodies or uh, or Santa Cruz County agencies, for example, pay equity. We might go to the EEO, um, criminal justice. We may work with the DA's office, legislation. Um, but our job is primarily to spot the problems, prioritize, and then bring it to the board for adoption to move forward and delegation for implementation. Um, <clears throat> so as with all things, and obviously by my background, I've been playing with data for, for many, many years. Um, and you have to do that in every capacity, regardless of your your uh, profession is you have to have the numbers to support um, what you're doing and to advocate for positions, um, whether you're in, a, in in any kind of organization. Um, so I was, well, I'll stop there. Um, I, I also want to be cognizant of translations, which I just realized I'm not being. <laughs> Um, thank you. Um, I think you can finish your thought if you had something that you want. Sure, to sure. Um, well, I was going to give a, a little bit more background about the commission. So, um, and how we're formulated, um, and organized. So there are two primary, um, organizational documents, one of which, um, is the 1976 United Nations Convention on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination Against Women, which is CEDAW in short. Um, and we've uh, urged our Board of Supervisors to adopt that. They have adopted that um, as a baseline for a focus of our mission. And then the second thing is, uh, the second document is a 2011 Santa Cruz County Commission report on the status of women and girls in Santa Cruz County. Um, and uh, using those two documents, we've aligned kind of our six subject matter ex uh, expertise, uh, and those are health care of women uh, within the county, uh, economic empowerment and justice. So, so that's pay equity and um, access to opportunities, as well as child care and other issues that impact women's ability to uh, be economically independent, uh, education, um, violence against women, which includes both both kind of random violence as well as obviously domestic violence and in our county uh, human trafficking, uh, both for labor and sex. Um, uh, criminal justice issues, um, both from how many women are getting arrested and for what, uh, availability of resources in prisons and jails, and obviously most important is um, uh, to decrease recidivism and provide um, resources to women uh, once they they leave incarceration, or or even if not, they're not incarcerated, they're they're convicted of something. Um, and then finally, political participation. So having more women in government positions and positions of making policy in the first instance, uh, as well as voting rights. Um, so those are our organizational principles. Um, I can leave it there. Or I can just keep talking about how the data share works works with this. Um, yeah, no, I think that that's a great framework. Thank you. And I think just to jump off of what you were speaking to or we're about to speak to is kind of, you know, how... I think it's helpful for folks to know how we got involved, you know, the commission and data share, and then um, how how we've worked with the community level indicators that are on that well-being spotlight that um, Nicole brought up in the beginning of this um, uh, conversation. Sure. So I, I should also say one of the requirements of, of CEDAW, which is the UN um, convention, is data collection and, and reporting and statistics and metrics and monitoring and, and all of those things. Um, so I was delighted. I had not known, didn't know that this resource existed until uh, uh, we were provided an opportunity to look at the, the, the women's specific spotlight. And I was trying to figure out how we're going to collect this information in order to spot inequities in the first instance and really drill down on what's going on in a very diverse county. 
Um, and so, and, I, and I'm talking about geographically, you know, Watsonville is different than Santa Cruz, is different than, you know, the mountains. And um, and so uh, we were given an opportunity to look at the women's spotlight, um, probably provided, you know, in our in our glee to have data um, too, too, too many, like, can you do this? Can you do that? You know, there's still gaps. Um, so we're still working through that, but it's a great initial resource. Um, and, and I'll just give you kind of three ways in which you know, being able to break down the data um, in in the way that that data share does it um, uh, is, for example, how are we doing in terms of pay and wage gaps uh, compared to other counties in California, or even compared to um, uh, statistics uh, kept uh, by the U.S. government. Um, uh, how is, and I, I mentioned, uh, you know, one of my interests is, you know, we have this uh, farm community in, in Watsonville with women laborers, which is very different than, you know, women in more urban areas. So, for example, how is health care and access to health care addressed region through region within our, our county? And data share actually can show regional breakdowns as well as um, getting the numbers for our county and then being able to compare them to the state. Um, and then uh, an, another, you know, aspect is, for example, criminal criminal justice. Um, another way that data share breaks down the data is by, um, you know, ethnic, ethnic background. So while we're focusing in on women, even within that um, within that sector of gender, we want to know, like, are women being treated equally uh, based on background, um, where they're from within the county and, and ethnic um, background? So uh, there's a lot of different ways to drill down even within the category of women um, so that we can make sure that our proposals are fact-based, data-based, and um, directed to uh, the right populations, even within a very diverse community. Yeah, I I know that um, at least the commission meeting that I attended, you know, that focus on kind of looking at those differences is um, as at the forefront. So I was going to ask you to speak to how you keep the equity dimensions in place as you are looking at the data throughout the county, but I think you kind of did just now. So I don't know if you would want to add anything to that. Yeah, I mean, I think that this is a project and the spotlight was a great starting point for us. It was more, and you probably know more about the spotlight, but it was, um, you know, data share is not, I mean, they'll show disparities with between uh, women and men and uh, gender, um, but it, it's not created specifically for that. So I think if we continue to mature this relationship, we could create a great dashboard that's that's um, more specific to our needs. And I'll, I'll go back because I mentioned like the six subject at um, areas that we have. We have different um, uh, commissioners from the Women's Commission working on those areas. I happen to be uh, leading kind of criminal justice efforts only because I used to be a prosecutor. <laughs> so I'm, you know, I have the, I can make those connections and um, ask the right questions. We have women from healthcare, we have women from education. And, and so one of the things, for example, that wasn't included in data share, and there's reasons for this because the criminal justice statistics are often highly sensitive, private, um, but is to build out a dashboard on, on, you know, again, I mentioned, you know, who are the women offenders? What crimes are the misdemeanors or felonies? What is the treatment? You know, do we have adequate resources, it's particularly healthcare resources for women? Um, you know, pregnancy, for example, um, and, and care, prenatal care, um, uh, re rehabilitation rates and resources, you know, once you get out, which blend with economic and educational opportunity and making sure there's enough support for women and to get them out of, you know, often violence and criminal justice are related. Um, I'll give you one example, for example, 
Uh, prostitution is often related to human trafficking. So we want to make sure that we're doing progressive things in terms of not turning women into the criminals when they're victimized uh, and making sure they're brought out of those situations. So there's a lot to still drill down on, but just knowing there's a resource and a, and a team to work with. Uh, and I'm sure my fellow commissioners have the same questions to build out in their their areas that they're focusing on. Um, so, you know, you can you can boil the ocean with data if you want. I tend to like to do that. But we just want to be able to really spot trends, um, compare ourselves to other counties who are doing better, you know, and go through all the steps you mentioned for actually um identifying and then helping with the policies around those. And you can't do any of that without the data to start with. And I know that um, this year, um, there's a number of um, actions happening with the Women's Commission and kind of um, your um, your program planning and advising. Um, can you speak a little bit I don't know at this point if you can talk about how the community indicators that you've selected are going to inform some of the policy implications and planning. Glad to know we don't have just one, but many puppies on board today. <laughs> Hi. <laughs> Sorry about that. Yeah, it's a little crazy. I have two dogs and then I got a puppy. Um, so <laughs> I don't know why. Um, I live in the mountains, so they run free. But uh, so. Um, one of the things that I really loved about data share is this, and I mentioned this before, this regional aspect, even within our county and the breakdown. Um, I also, outside of the women's spotlight, we saw some interesting statistics that we might want to drill down and by adding a gender, um, by adding a gender uh, fun function <laughs> um, or, or comparison, um, so, uh, but I love this um, regional uh, detail that's allowed. And I was gonna actually ask if we had a, a map um, for Santa Cruz County, it's quite large, but, you know, I often wonder are women, the farming communities getting as many resources, uh, getting the support, getting um, uh, access to, you know, healthcare and law enforcement that they need. And um, having that breakdown is particularly interesting to me. Um, not not to, you know, I, I just wonder if, you know, Santa Cruz, it's, it's all available and there's transportation. So, you know, once you've spotted disparity, then you think about, I mentioned transportation, women have children, can they get to the resources? Can they, you know, what is it that, that we can then drill down on to provide actual actionable um, recommendations for policy changes um, and work with the, the appropriate agencies on that. So I don't know if that answers your question, but that's one example that stands out is this regional um, regional comparison. There's the ethnic com comparison, and then there's the comparisons with the state. How are we doing with other, um, compared to other ca uh, counties in California? And, and because I have some, you know, you can access also data through U.S. Health and Human Services um, that that measure the well-being of women. You can also compare the county to to other, you know, similar similarly situated places in the United States. So um, it's nice to be able to do it from all of those angles to figure out and set priorities. That's great. And Nicole Lezen, I don't know if you wanted to hop in and ask any, if you were inspired to ask any questions for Jennifer at this point. I, th I think you've covered the ground that we had talked about. And I wondered if others had questions either on developing the data spotlight or for Jennifer specifically about some of the data the commission's working with or, or connections to your own work. Anything you want to ask while we're while we have use the opportunity? Data generally <laughs> in the right. world. I said the use of data generally in the world these days. That, in order yeah, to sure. Data. That's but, fair game. I mean, I can't make it. I'll, I'll say, I'll just, you know, professionally, 
when you're advocating for a compliance change or, um, a, you know, an internal policy change and you're working in a business that's there to make money. So, you know, you're just legal. <laughs> uh, you really, I, I often gather the hard data, the numbers, the costs, the impact, the potential penalties and legal risks to make my case. I mean, hard data, uh, and I'm probably speaking to the choir, but hard data is tremendously important to to be a good advocate to. Um, and so having those public resources of data are tremendously, uh, just a, such a community service. So I wanted to thank DataShare and CORE. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's good to hear that that was so helpful, and also that you know that that's a, a path for people to find um, curated groupings of data. Um, but it can still be really overwhelming on data share because we, you know, I'm sure we all hear that a lot of just where to start, um, where to go, which rabbit hole to fall into, and um, to make your case for your your program and your and the policies that you're trying to pursue, um, it does it does take some some time to sift through all of these different options and um, and if you're if you're new to that, we just don't want you to get discouraged because <laughs> there are yeah, some, and some I, I would add to that too. It's it's not it, it, it the methodology matters a lot too. So I know that when we were looking at certain statistics for data share to, to comment um, and play around with, you know, the underlying assumptions um, have to be very, very clear. Uh, the statistical body that you're dealing with in terms of, you know, how many people are we talking about? Um, so suddenly, is that sometimes you have to broaden the scope, which is why you can't necessarily uh, you know, the underlying data for the data comparisons have to, has to be there and it has to be sound. So, so yeah, so, so it's always good to, you know, when we were going through and it was a great resources, but we were like, well, what is this based on? And why is this, you know, compared to this? What does this mean? Um, so when you're looking at data, you can, you, you also have to think about, um, you know, what were those basic assumptions and are, was the population big enough in particular to really draw any conclusions from, from the data? So you do have to have an eye uh, toward it, but um, it's a it's a great goal to work with. And I, I would just add to that, that one of the advantages of data share is that um, there has been a process to um, make sure that things are accurate and timely and are collected at regular intervals so that you can look at some trends over time. So a lot of that um, trying to assess um, which data might be useful, relevant, et cetera, is, is done before it ever gets onto the, the data share platform. It doesn't mean that there aren't other useful pieces of data out there or reports and um, you know, it's it's not the only source, but it's just it's collected to make it easier for you to find um, related pieces of data that affect your program and your policies. Yeah, and and another thing is, I'd like to continue the discussion. I mean, we had a a list of things like, oh, we'd love this and this. I meant I mentioned criminal justice, and you know, we were. I was said, well, we're about to publish this spotlight, so let's continue the conversation. So I think, um, you know, that's also, uh, uh, it, it's not intended, for example, the general data share is not intended specifically to look at women's issues. So, you know, breaking down just, you know, male to female and then within women and then within region, you know, there's there's a lot the more. Age groups. Yeah. So, um, so it's a continuing discussion as well. Yeah. Any other questions for Eva? I'm just wondering if it would Rachel? actually be worth um, spending a few more minutes actually sharing your screen again, Nicole or Eva, and um, walking us through the women's well-being data spotlights. I know that uh, we also shared in the chat a link to one of the specific indicators, but 
Do you want to um, do that? Are you able to? Sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. the, the group might like a little bit of background about what's the spotlight and how did that come into being versus what's kind of the platform, the more permanent data share platform, which is not women specific or gender specific, I should say. Yeah. Um, yeah. I, so I'll, I'll bring this up um, here in a second. I'll say that. So the, the spotlight pages on data share are um, generally theme community themes that are relevant in a certain moment in time um, that we publish in a blog format. And so the idea is that we kind of give a brief overview and some, um, some basic um, kind of analysis points on what the data is saying um, in this blog format. It's a one page. Um, all of the all of the spotlights have a similar structure, so it'll say what's what's the issue, why is it important, what is the data saying of what's available on the platform, and then um, usually we'll have also um, what are local policies and programs that are addressing this issue, as well as what are some um, more in-depth analysis and um, some more in-depth resources um, that you can look for to um, to get more information on this particular issue. So um, the women's, we did a women's well-being spotlight like two or three years ago when I first um, started working with DataShare. Um, and um, I think it's developed much more in, into a much richer a resource since um, being able to work with the Women's Commission. And so one of the things was like, for example, with the gender pay gap, and I'll, I'll bring it up in just a second, um, but um, was really trying to digest, okay, what is a gender pay what is a gender pay gap we talk about it what does it look like for our county are the um you know are the race and ethnicity breakouts uh sufficiently statistically significant um to be able to draw conclusions from or is this a gap that we would like to highlight because that's also important um you know uh if we have this list of of data that we want to look at or themes that we want to see more about and it's not on this resource where could we go looking or where do we need to invest as a community in those gaps to be able to find out more, to be able to really um, analyze and um, and come to some conclusions about as a whole. So um, it's been a great conversation and um, and um, working relationship with the commission. And in terms of the history of it, um, I, I um, have been in contact with the commissioners since the fall. Um, and um, was able, and we'll do some practice in a minute, but just kind of did a did a, a dashboard of how many of the of the indicators that we have on the uh, platform have the breakouts for gender, and which of those fall under the categories that the commission is working with. And so that's that was the starting point. And then which of those indicators are actually giving the useful information for the commissioners to be able to draw an analysis, and then um, you know some policy recommendations around. So that that was the basic. Um, and and one of the things that we're doing with the commission to after we had our initial like review of spotlight and working with Eva and and trying to possibly and I don't know where we are on this so I don't want to <laughs> overcommit Eva but and data share but you know creating a women's dashboards um aligned and 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 um out you know uh, uh, pursuant to our six you know focus areas um, and then figuring out where the data resources are working with so that we can, again, I'll use criminal justice, figure out what the county is collecting, the sheriff's office, the DA's office, the police, you know, um, that we can then uh, tap into as public information. Um, and, and, you know, that's you got to find the data first, right? Before, before you figure out how you're going to present it and what you're going to look at. So um, I think that's where like now the commission, the commissioners on each of these subject matter um, areas are working on figuring out who are our contacts, what data exists, can it be made public, can it be shared, uh, that kind of stuff. So, and what's the quality of it? Yeah. Yeah. Thanks, Jennifer. Um, and I'll just share this, um, the spotlight again. Um, 
And um, I think that um, one of the things, so um, I think some folks get a little bit lost on the demographics. So if you go to any of this mapping that we have here, it'll give you an overview of these demographics. So I'll just say that. Um, you're welcome to go into that rabbit hole um, as you wish. Um, and then you'll see that we have these categories that um, uh, that Jennifer spoke to and um, a highlighted data point is listed here um, with some interpretation of what the data point is saying, in this case, the gender pay gap. And I'm just realizing I have this in editing mode, so just ignore those little edit buttons. I was um, working on the platform this morning. <laughs> um, and then um, a series of indicators that are related to economic justice are in this mini dashboard. Um, and just as a added resource, I'll say that these dashboards are easily embedded into other websites. You can download them as is um, if you're doing a report on, you know, economic justice. And each of these indicators have the gender breakouts. Um, so, um, you know, you can go into them and um, learn a little bit more about how um, each indicator uh, what what each integrator states about um, the gender dimension. We have childcare um, in the same format with its mini dashboard. Um, so, um, you know, like Jennifer was saying, are we going to have a, a you know a standing dashboard for um, for women's well being in the county as a as a resource of the commission? And this is one way in which these dashboards are already kind of created and have a a go-to way to um, interpret. Um, certainly some, um, you know, analysis and expertise is necessary to really make meaning out of it. Like any data point standalone um, really isn't going to be helpful. So that's why, you know, everyone in this room with their areas of expertise can, um, can definitely interact better with uh, the data points that most speak to their impact areas. Um, and... Thing. I don't know if we want to get into this too much, Nicole, because we're going to do some playing around on the platform, but um, I'll just say that, um, you know, uh, we're mostly a quantitative data platform and um, we really lean on um, the work of agencies in this room, as well as, you know, state and local agencies um, to produce the analysis that um, supports um, the best use of the data. So um, I think I'll stop there. It's Eva and Jennifer, I think um, that's a good illustration of where some sort of uh, curated groupings of data specific to an issue, in this case, uh, gender equality can be compiled. But I wanted to return briefly to the core results menu and show you some other indicators uh, related, but but possibly um, just to, to stimulate your thinking about where to find some of these. If, if you're relatively new to data share, or even if you have some experience and haven't, haven't played with the results menu yet. So I'm gonna share my screen again. Um, Nicole, just because we have a hard stop. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, before we go that, I just want to thank Jennifer. Thank you so much for coming and chatting about your experience. I know you need um, to get off right now, but um, we really appreciate your expertise and just sharing the experience of the commission um, with this uh, data platform and, and the work that we're doing together. Thank you for inviting me. Um, it's great to see all these organizations in Santa Cruz County um, and uh, look forward to working with you more. I do have a hard stop. So thank you very much. Thanks, Jennifer. And there goes the dog. <laughs> Bye. Yes. We know that one. Okay. Um, let me share the results menu, um, which I meant to do earlier. Okay. So, again, the way to get here is local progress pages. And the first one is the core results menu. And this might look familiar to you from Nicole Young's overview earlier or other core coffee chats or, or events. A number of resources here. Um, we did just briefly show you the continuum of results and evidence, but there are others as well. But what I really wanted to highlight was this version of the results menu that has groupings for eight core conditions that you see here, and then some 
uh, you can click on any of these indicators that particularly speak to you. So let's say that you were um, interested in health behaviors, that, that part of health and wellness, then maybe you would click on this one. And similar to what Eva just showed with the, um, the Women's Wellbeing Data Dashboard, you can see some pre-selected indicators that together are designed to give you a picture of that issue in our county. You can look for more data, you can compare to other counties, you can do a lot with what's here, but you can also explore beyond what's here. Um, and you can do this for, for any of the indicators that are listed on the results menu. So any of these that I'm highlighting now as I scroll down. And I also wanted to mention that um, in case you haven't done this or haven't noticed this, you can translate to mm -hmm. other languages, all of these pages. So they're accessible that way as well. So any, mm -hmm. any questions about how to get here or some ways to use this? Because we're gonna we're gonna take a few minutes to um, explore this together. Okay, now I'm gonna switch back to the slides. See if I can do this without losing things all together. Okay, here they are. So similar to what Jennifer and Eva described for the uh, women's well-being spotlight, we wanted to see if together we could look at some community indicators. So if you wanna to go to that core results menu and see if there are some that are particularly relevant to your program or policy initiative, um, something that you're contributing to. So again, you're not responsible for the, the whole um, impact of that indicator, but are contributing to it. And then just mm -hmm. spend a few minutes mm -hmm. looking through it, seeing if there are some equity dimensions to it, um, whether there are ways that that those community indicators can help inform your program planning. And in specific to today's discussion, whether there's a public policy question mm -hmm. that you wonder about or that, um, that you could ask about that influences that indicator. So this is just a loose, let's explore, let's see what's there and what, what questions and conversations it might spark. Um, and then we'll, we'll see what, what that yields. So any questions about what we're doing or how to get there? I'll, I'll leave this slide up for a moment. Or maybe some of you have already done this. Okay, let's spend about five minutes just seeing how far you get, and then we'll hear back from anyone who wants to share. And thanks, Gisela, for putting the questions in the chat. If you're stuck or are not sure what we're doing or want some guidance on getting to the indicators on the results menu, just raise your hand or feel free to send either of us a chat.
Do we have any volunteers who have found their way through some of these indicators? Want to share what they found? Or if you got stuck um, and feel like sharing that, we can try to get you unstuck. I feel like our group is getting smaller by the minute. <laughs> Okay, let's see. I think Teresa had her hand up and then Nora. Thank you both. Yeah, hi, Nicole. Thank you so much. I was actually just waving goodbye. I was going to hit the end key. Oh, okay. So I wasn't looking for this, but what I what I did look for, so I'm going to write the core grant for the Your Future is our business nonprofit in Santa Cruz. And so I, I went into um, lifelong learning and education tab and then I was able to click on the um to see the graduation rate like 42 percent of students in Santa Cruz County do graduate um with the high school diploma so um and then I wanted to see how many students uh go on to higher education levels after they graduate from high school and how those programs that like your future is our business they influence the students to get out there and to get jobs. So uh, it was really informational. And if I and I can compare it to other counties or I can uh, just click the buttons on the side and go further into like different states or, you know. Oh, great. The plan yeah. To these <laughs> yeah, thanks. So so was that a new a new resource for you? Yes, it was. It's really I like this a lot. It's going to help me so make my process faster. Oh, I'm yeah. so glad to hear that. Well, yeah. thanks for sharing that. And I'm um, sorry I misinterpreted your wave, but we'll wave no, back. That's okay. Thanks for calling on me. You guys have a great day. Thank you so much. We'll see you next time. Okay, Nora, looks like you have the floor. What did oh my. You it's a lot of pressure. Um, no pressure. Real, real. <laughs> Thank you both, Nicole and Eva. Uh, I'm brand new to this conversation. I've recently joined as a director the Coastal Kids Home Care. If you're not familiar with them, we are pediatric home care and palliative care agency covering Monterey, San Benito, Santa Clara, Santa Cruz counties. Um, we are being um, pulled into the mental health um, challenges and services in support of, the, of, of a pediatric population, um, focusing in part on bereavement and grief services for mental health. And I, you know, I, I was trying to find what intersectionality there might be between what we do and what this database might offer us as we consider how to best meet this demand for counseling and social work services for a population of children, you know, through youth who are struggling uh, either with their own life-threatening illness or have lost a sibling or are dealing with the potential loss of a sibling. Um, I don't really know how to navigate the site. I'm not asking you necessarily to show that to me today, but we deal largely with the Medi-Cal population, not entirely, but largely. And um, one of the points I was looking for just out of curiosity for myself was, did the suicide rate as the storyline was increase tenfold or whatever the, the urban myth was during the pandemic or not. Um, I So I just was pulling up some of, trying to find some of that mental health data and some of the results to that, just to see if there was some validity to the data, or to the storylines being offered and the narratives being offered in the public. Mm -hmm. um, but mostly, I and mean, if we try to find the uh, use for the data, it would be, I think, in support of not only uh, the mental health programs, but, you know, we're looking to expand into some other counties with a certain types of service offerings, which would, of course, most likely include mental health services for a population that is struggling with a sibling or a child or a, who has a life-threatening illness. 
So it's interesting. I don't know what the validity of the data is. I'm not sure where the data is being sourced from and its integrity. Like those are the ones that some of the questions, but you know, certainly our board would welcome anything that would um, enhance our own sort of interpretation of the, the need for these services uh, in Santa Cruz County. And then of course, beyond as we expand further north. Okay, thanks. So, thank you. Um, I can see a lot of connect the dots kinds of questions embedded in in what you're seeking there, and and just want to um, share that it and we can do the, some of this offline too. But there, you can really um, learn a lot about the sources of the data and and make your own assessments about them as well. Um, but they do go through a a process of um, ensuring that there's validity and data cleaning kinds of things. Um, and Eva's pointing out in the chat that, um, because you mentioned multiple counties and a regional approach that Monterey County has its own um, data share platform that you might wanna check out. And it might be worth just saying and showing, so again, it's also on the video recording that um, for all of the indicators that are on data share that you can find on data share um you can see and so the actual source will vary depending on what the data is but then it'll give you a sense of okay where is this coming from so if you do want to do any more everyone kind of digging to see okay where did that data come from in terms of the original source um every every indicator on data share will then kind of lead you down a path of if you wanted to see where does the original data come from um, it's there as well because you're you're raising some good questions Nora about um you know kind of starting with that question of okay here's the predominant narrative is there data out there to back that up to either strengthen you know a particular case you're trying to make for a need for a service, or is it um, more like urban legend or urban myth? Because once it's said and then it gets repeated, then all of a sudden it's like, you know, um, it's hard to know, okay, is that, you know, factual or, or where does that data come from? Um, the other thing that can be really helpful to look at in each of these indicators to then decide whether and how you use the data is then looking at where, you know, what time period the data is from. So some with some of these data sources, particularly you know the, these statewide data sources, it often takes um, the state or some of these other sources a couple of years before they get their data cleaned and ready to share. So by the time it appears on platforms like Data Share, the data itself might be already a couple of years old. And so you can see here like the the last measurement period for this particular indicator around age adjusted death rate due to suicide um it's only you know part way through the pandemic even so so I things like that it just helps I, you yeah, kind of i found myself about. to this very page and i was trying mm -hmm. to interpret this when it says age adjusted age adjusted death rate due to suicide um it and again, I'm not exactly clear on what this was showing me in this in this graph. Like, does that suggest that the the death rate declined at least for the period of 2019 through 2021, which captures two years of the pandemic? Um, uh, but again, I wasn't exactly sure. I, I had to. I'm going to have to sit with that page a little bit mm -hmm. as well, mm -hmm. um, because it's 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 the death rate that's being shown here, not the age, the average age of death or anything along those lines. Obviously, mm -hmm. it's the actual death rate. It does look like in 2019 to 2021, it dropped rather than increased, as was the urban myth mm -hmm. that was being touted. And so I was I, I found my way to this page, but again, I I'm not exactly sure how to interpret it perfectly yet. That's true of a lot of them, but they do um, they do reward spending some time with them. And then also sometimes it's something on data share alongside another resource or, or data point that helps to increase understanding. We often talk about the data on data share and in the core results menu as being conversation starters rather than enders. <laughs> so there, you know, it's really something to say, I wonder if, I wonder why. 
how come we don't know this? Um, so it's not always satisfying when you have a grant due in 48 hours or something like that, but it is, um, it, it does lead to some um, better explorations of the nuances behind data and understanding what both what is there and what isn't there. And as Eva pointed out earlier, I just wanna remind all of us um, for, those, for all of those reasons, data share is constantly evolving and updating. And so something that is not there today may well be there in, in the near future. And um, Eva, I don't wanna deluge you with questions and requests, but I, I, my understanding is that Eva is very open to um, conversations about how to how to use the platform, what might be hidden, missing, et cetera, and how to resolve uh, any any issues people have accessing the data. So any other examples people want to share? Thank you, Nora. I don't have an example, but I'll just have a tiny testimonial. Okay, um, great. We'll take it. <laughs> I'm Melanie from the Diversity Center, and I've actually had a meeting with Eva to talk about um, kind of our struggles around representation for the LGBTQ plus community when it comes to um, harvesting data and having up-to-date non-othering data <laughs> and um, and uh, building non-othering surveying and evaluation because um, we do spend uh, a good amount of time uh, reinterpreting all of the different kind of evaluation tools out there so that they are non-harmful, non-othering to our LGBTQ plus constituents and then reinterpreting it out uh, to funders. So just having partnership and understanding and an ear in data share has been um, kind of a silver lining for us of, of seeing a future for better representation for the LGBTQ plus community in data share. Thanks, Melanie. That's great to hear. And what a perfect seg to our next um, thing we wanted to share, which is before we close out, which is that we have some upcoming um, core institute events, including um, one with your colleagues on best practices in data collection and sharing related to sexual orientation and gender identity. So that's on June 11th. And then, as I mentioned earlier, we're also exploring theories of change and logic models with an equity lens in a bit more detail than we have um, in the last couple sessions. So if that's something that you're interested in um, developing for, for proposals and grant writing, or just in general for planning purposes, um, we hope you'll join us. That's next week, isn't it? <laughs> yes, next week, the 6th. Um, here comes June careening around the corner. So um, you can sign up for all of these and other events and also view uh, past recordings and materials um, from CORE Institute events at the CORE um, events website. Anything you wanna add, Nicole? Just that the June 6th training on developing a theory of change and logic model is actually the first mm -hmm. um, training in the series of, of core investments, RFP specific training and TA assistance that we're able to offer. Um, the rest of the schedule will become public and available and we'll open up the registration as soon as the county actually releases the request for proposals uh, I believe that June 3rd is still their their date that they're aiming for. So it's coming soon, but because this June 6th training is coming up next week, we did want to let people know about it and we have opened up the registration. Um, there isn't going to be like, and if you're, if you're thinking of applying for core funding, there's no requirement that you have a theory of change or a logic model, but we do like to offer that training first because it can really help uh, provide a framework and some structure to your program planning as you think about what you want to apply for through core um, with 
similar to many grant applications, there's a character limit for questions. So the more dialed in you are to your plans and you're thinking about, you know, what it is you're applying for and why, um, the easier ish it will be <laughs> to <laughs> actually prepare the application. So developing a theory change in logic model, uh, as you probably picked up on earlier from Nicole Lezen, we're, we're big fans of that as a, as a really important planning step. Yes. And that being said, so while the June 6th um, session is geared to the core um, request for proposals, if you're not planning on applying for core funding, it would likely still be useful. And there are um, prior versions of that content um, available as recordings, and this will be recorded as well and is offered in English and Spanish. So, any other questions? questions or comments. Um, we are always interested in your feedback on individual sessions and on what else might be useful to you. There will be a survey coming out soon. <laughs> Either today or tomorrow. Um, today or tomorrow. And we just want you to keep an eye out for it. If, if you're signed up for these events, you'll be on the mailing list um, for it. But we just really encourage you to take, take a few moments. We know everybody has a lot of surveys clouding their inboxes, um, but we, we really pay attention to your feedback. Um, you might get a little gift card um, if you're among the first to respond. And we really, um, we really, need and want to hear from you about what else would be helpful moving forward. So um, keep an eye out for that. And other than that, we just want to thank you for being here and for your interest. Thanks, Eva, for uh, sharing the, the data share platform um, and all of these great tools and for lining up uh, Jennifer. That was a really interesting discussion. And please use these QR codes to to give us feedback on today's session and um, let us know if you have other thoughts. Our emails are here. Um, we'll hang out for a few minutes if people have any lingering questions, um, but thanks, thanks for being here and for your participation. Thanks to Stella and Gisela for the interpretation and translation. Always appreciated. And that's it.